the FTF podcast lay in excitement, and it was an excitement in three parts. The most obvious part was the excitement of a new buddy read, one of The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Hosting this podcast are longtime friends Charles and Dylan. This is their first time that they are discussing this book, and their anticipation added to the excitement. Then there's you, the listener. This podcast is for you, just as the third part is yours. This is appropriate, as it is hopefully the greatest excitement of the three, wrapping the others inside itself. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear my snapping? Zoom is kind of cutting out this the snapping. No, I can't really hear it, but I can see it. Okay, I snapped. Hopefully the <laughs> listeners can hear it, because that was beautiful, Charles. Thank you. I was so excited and so moved by Patrick's words that I wanted to pay some homage and get the show off right. Yeah, and homage was paid. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. As we said in the intro, this is a very exciting day. We kick off our second Buddy Read series, starting with The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And I'm looking forward to getting into this with you, my buddy, Charles. I'm looking forward to getting into it as well. I mean, should we just not waste any time and and get right into this? Why waste any time? I think that three, that tripartite excitement, Charles, yes. is just knocking on the door. And I, I think it might just bust it down. So let's just get into this. Let's do it. So would you like to introduce The Name of the Wind? Yeah, we're going to break our pattern here by having <laughs> me read the intro. Well, you did a Are great job writing it, so let's hear it. Oh, thanks, Charles. Quoth, a legendary figure who is more myth than man by this point, is in hiding, posing as an innkeeper named Coat. He relays his story to two people, a chronicler who has tracked him down, and Quoth's pupil, Bast. Quoth tells the first third of his story, including his childhood, attending the university, and a trip to the town of Trayvon that results in the city being burned to the ground. Beautiful, beautiful. This is uh, exciting, man. How do we even jump into this? I mean, I think that the the first thing that comes to mind for me as someone who I've read this series already, but I'm sitting here virtually with a person who has yet to read the series before, which means <laughs> I'm just looking forward to hearing from you, Charles. I mean, we've tried to avoid talking about this book the entire time so we could get <laughs> the authentic reaction. Uh, yes, this is a long time coming. You listeners may know from the Friends Pitching Fantasy episode when this was selected that this is one of Marsh's favorites, one of the world's, the modern fantasy world's favorites that I have never read. I went in completely cold into this series. So I guess I'll kick it off with my first impressions. And what I have to say is I was uh, really excited and I, I was super thrilled with my experience. Uh, the prose of Patrick Rothfuss just pulled me in right away with that, you know, that silence of three parts that kind of pulled me in and stuck with my brain enough that I had to um, replicate it at the beginning of the podcast. But such uh, this beautiful descriptive language that sets the tone for the setting and the voice of the characters. It was truly masterful in that respect. And coming off of Mistborn, which was very, uh, I would say, plot-heavy, structure-heavy, to have something that's more like prose and character-heavy was very refreshing. And to come into something new and just reading it as a first-time reader was also very refreshing as well. So I had a great time going through it. Well, I'm so happy to hear that. I obviously had to put on my 
marketing cap to try to pitch <laughs> us to you, Charles. And, and you know that that cap fits you a lot better than it fits me. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> I, I found a way to get it on and I tried to sell this best I could. So I'm happy to hear that you've really enjoyed it that much. And it was also... on my reading list for a long time. I, As we know from the Pitching Fantasy episode, I never got into it because... It, the series wasn't finished, but I think having the podcast and a, a format where we can record our conversation, and you know, it's such a popular series. I was more than happy to jump into it and uh, it didn't take much selling on your part, but what you did was excellent and it was all I needed to, to choose it. Well, I'm glad you did jump in. I think that something that came to mind for me after reading Mistborn, which we had an awesome time with, yes. and then getting into the Kingkiller Chronicle, is I felt like this this phrase almost kept keeping up, kept coming up for me, which is that uh, Mistborn was about the destination, but Kingkiller is about the journey, and I think that's, that's so why I felt like. It was easier for us to just dive into something that isn't finished yet because it's not really about, at least for, for me anyway, it's not really about where it will end up. It's more about how enjoyable a process it is just living in Rothfuss's world, which is conveyed to you through that absolutely beautiful prose. Like yes. Each sentence is so perfectly crafted. And it, if you're going to write a book that's about the experience and the journey to complement it with his writing style, that's very prose heavy, very thoughtful, very insightful, lots of very unique metaphors and turns of phrases that not only are descriptive and sound great, but explain so much. <laughs> it's like the silence in three parts, it explains so much of what's going on at that end in the beginning that you're right away, you understand kind of what the headspaces of all of these characters in the setting within two pages so I was just um, enjoying the experience and taking it in <laughs> paragraph by paragraph so it was a very nice change of pace and I was very impressed with it well I think you approached it with the right perspective to enjoy this book and I feel like when people miss the mark on this book, and maybe we'll get into some of that in our review of the reviews episode. Coming I think up. we will. Uh, <laughs> when people miss the mark on this, or, or maybe I should say, when people j just don't enjoy it as much, it's because they're looking for that more typical story structure you're looking for. And I think if you're willing to just let Rothfuss tell you an amazing story, then you're probably going to be in for a good time definitely definitely i mean if S sanderson does such a good job of looking out for the reader and making sure that every book is its contained experience with payoffs and build up and uh, exciting action but rothfuss is painting a picture basically he's doing such a good job of of fleshing out this story and this character and he and he take he's taking his time with it, and he makes points throughout it not to follow like a specific sh any kind of specific format of storytelling. He's just kind of 
walking you through what's happening through the eyes of the character, which is, he's so great at being able to change voices. And, and it's just a very pleasant experience overall. I think we should just jump right into Patrick's <laughs> Patrick Rothfuss's use of use of voice in this book because when you have a book that's so much about uh, storytelling and you have a book that's so much about um, performance and and myths and legends and the point of view is basically three like the whole story is three men sitting at a table and one of them telling his life story the use of voice in this book is in my opinion masterful yeah, I think I, I want to get into more about voice, and I'm curious what you're bringing there. I want to say, too, that I, I love that you mentioned that he intentionally goes against what we'd expect in a lot of typical story structure, and there's a lot of awareness that's displayed, particularly by Quoth in the frame story, where he's he's very aware he's telling a story where he is uh, trying to say, Hey, this is my actual life. This isn't some story that's just going to neatly follow exactly what you think it should be. And there's a part where chronicler asks him or basically chronicler and Bast are talking to him about what would happen next. And uh, Quoth is saying, yeah, like if this were a, story right after and i guess i sh- i should say spoilers but uh the point of these episodes are to read the book and then come yes. in and hear us discuss it so that's uh, taken for granted to some extent uh, so quotes parents end up getting uh, killed in the story's telling and then they're asking him what's gonna happen next all this stuff about getting vengeance against the chandrian and uh, chronicler says hey yeah if this were a story then you'd train up and then you just go out and you'd kill him and quoth describes it as clean quick and easy as lying we know how it ends practically before it starts that's why stories appeal to us they give us the clarity and simplicity our real lives lack and so much of what rothfuss and and quoth therefore are trying to show is this isn't supposed to be a story this is supposed to be an autobiography and, very true or it isn't supposed to be a story in the, in the typical sense it's supposed to be a man's autobiography right. and through that it like we're all people living lives we know yeah. that our lives don't neatly follow the structure of uh, you know rising action climax falling action and so on Right. And I had made notes of that through my reading also, because not even in like the framing story does he mention that, but even when he's telling the story and there's moments uh, that almost set themselves up to be tropes, Quoth as the narrator makes these specific moments to point out like, yeah, this was the trope. It would have played out this way. But yeah. it played out this way. And one of the quotes that I had is there's a scene where I guess um, they're, uh, he's with Denna and Denna's like, or he, and he's like falling and Denna like I reaches out to like, about. to like grab yeah. him. And he was like, if this were some <laughs> heroic ballad, I would tell you how she clasped my hand firmly and pulled me to safety. But the truth is she got hold of my shirt with one hand while the other made a tight fist in my hair. So he's like, and he does this multiple times throughout the book where he's like, yeah, I could tell you that we like fi- we squared off and I beat him in this epic moment. And it was so great, but it didn't play out like that. So anytime you as a seasoned reader see these like uh, plots being set up, most books will like set them up and play around with them and like leave you hanging for a while before they um, resolve. But Quoth makes a point to say, I know what you're thinking that this might happen this way, but it didn't. It happened in a much more mundane, uninteresting way. So I, and that happened multiple times throughout the book. So while we're talking about that kind of setting of expectations and the use of storytelling as a way to forego some more traditional structure was really well done in this book. 
I totally agree. And I was also <laughs> noticing those moments and the one that stuck out to me most too was that, that one with Denna. <laughs> yeah. I I grabbed a, a couple other quotes that I found were pretty interesting. I'm wondering if you, you have any. It sounds like you wrote some down too. Oh yeah, I have a whole thing of of quotes and because because the best part of reading the series was um reading pat patrick's prose i i uh i just <laughs> i highlighted a whole bunch and i went back and and basically made a catalog of some of my favorites so we'll see what comes up but yeah absolutely i got tons yeah well i'll <laughs> i'll tell another one that fits with this theme of stories i i think this whole thing this uh, this whole novel is a story about someone telling a story that is about stories basically <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and uh, there's i mean throughout the the frame story and the the actual retelling of quoth's life there are all these opportunities where we're not just quoth but others comment on the I, all these ideas of storytelling. And I thought that one that was really interesting as almost a counterpoint and balance to some of what Quoth uh, actually says throughout with like those denim moments and things like that, where he's saying, oh, if this were a story, it'd be like that. Uh, there's also a couple of quotes, one, one was from Quoth uh, that he says the best lies about me are the ones I told. Yeah. And the <laughs> there's another one from Scarpy that you have to be a bit of a liar to tell a story the right way. Too much truth confuses the facts. Too much honesty makes you sound insincere. And I thought this is so interesting because there's this uh, push pull of quoth as both someone who's trying to say, oh, yeah, no, it actually went down like this, even though the legends have it that way. But he's also dropping tons of lines and hints, because obviously even the Scarpy quote is Quoth saying it. Right. Yeah, he's dropping these lines throughout that pretty much show that Quoth is a storyteller who doesn't let the facts get in the way of a good story. And it's, it's a really interesting balancing act that Rothfuss plays here. Absolutely. The the whole idea of whose voice it is and the context in which they're telling it is never lost in this story, but it can go <laughs> like you're explaining. It can go like three levels deep. It's, it's quote telling a story about himself and then other, and he's explaining other people telling stories to him. So it's a story of him being told a story and, and Patrick changes and it's in a novel, the, which is obviously a story. Yeah. <laughs> so Patrick is is changing the voice of the narrator to fit the moment and the context, and it's really interesting to read all of those different kinds of shifts in 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 style and tone. Uh, one of the first ones for me that I loved was when uh, Quoth was being told a story by Trappis. And, mm -hmm. and Trappist is not a storyteller. I think he mentioned like that's the <laughs> only time he ever told a story. And as he was he's like oh, a long time ago, there was this person or wait, was it before? Or after? Like, he, like the story kept stopping <laughs> because he kept forgetting like points or the order of things. And he's like, no, 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 wait, go back. It was this thing. Or he's like, oh, what, whatever. We'll say it was this, you know? So it was so interesting. And then very shortly after that, you get told a similar story from Scarpy, who's a professional, who's a professional yep. storyteller. And he tells that beautiful uh, uh, tale that uh, sets off that like kind of inspires, like kind of wakes up Quoth and get him to, to, to leave this city and go to find the college. So it was so interesting to see, all those different points of view and different storytelling styles and all just about like what makes a good story and how you, he, Patrick's able to go into the minds of each character to kind of change the voice. So it feels like someone is literally sitting next to you and he conveys a lot of personality through just how the story is being told, which is, which is really impressive. That's really well stated, Charles. <laughs> it's, 
all about how Rothfuss, through Quoth, who has this Adima Rue, both theatrical training and theatrical mindset, mm-hmm. is jumping into all of these different characters within his own story and then putting on their voices. Right. And it's set up in a way where we're able to buy in because <laughs> there's so much done for why Quoth would be such a good storyteller. And it's, right. it's I, just beautiful. There's one scene where he's like studying at where Quoth is studying at the college and he's with all his friends at the bar and they're talking about Denna and they're talking about like describing her and Quoth is like, she can't be described. <laughs> and one of his <laughs> friends is like, bets he can describe her and he's like she had perfect ears he made a delicate gesture with his hands perfect little ears like they were carved out of something <laughs> so it's, and then all his friends were laughing and quote was laughing and it was just one of those moments where it's like uh <laughs> the use of storytelling to establish character and it's funny because like in the same breath you read these amazing poetic metaphors and things and then he's writing another character that has no skills in description and he's trying to describe perfect ears that were carved and it's like it was just a funny moment for me and it was also a good scene where you you feel like you're actually in the bar with your friends and they're all laughing and they're all making fun of him for saying like perp- they're like ears why are you describing your ears and and he's he doubles down he's like ears are important like yeah, you need good ears <laughs> doesn't Bast also mention her ears though when- it, i think that is Bast, is it not Oh, I was. I thought maybe you were referring to because Bast and Chronicler obviously are. Oh yes, there yes. And... So they're not. So he's not in the tavern in college. He's they're in the the Waystone. Oh, okay. Inn. Okay, that is the part I was confused. It was the Waystone Inn, and it was Bast. Yeah, but they were they were all having a good laugh at that, which uh, I really enjoyed. That was a good character moment. And it good, was, another good yeah. use of changing the narrator and changing the voice to establish character, which is so well done. For sure. So also in that moment, there's another one of those hints that Quoth might not be as reliable a narrator as <laughs> <laughs> I guess some might hope. I don't know. <laughs> and that's where Quoth is trying to say how perfect Denna is in every way and then Bast who has seen her once to to know how perfect her ears are of course uh, (laughs) he says that Denna has had a crooked nose yes yes (laughs) and I love that with and Bast also points out that all the all the women in quotes stories are described as so beautiful and this is kind of our our one moment to say okay the one person who another person in the room in the frame story has actually seen it's like oh yeah like bass thought she was attractive and had some features he was into but (laughs) he (laughs) he also is like okay you can't tell me this person was like flawless in every way like (laughs) and I think that was a nice moment too yeah and then quote was like yeah it's indescribable how do you describe beauty and so I thought it was no, I thought that was a really funny moment and just a great just a great example of character, especially, you know, coming from Mistborn also, to have characters like have that natural free flowing dialogue and to be la- making each other laugh and being in that nice, quiet, comfy setting. It it was a great piece of character that I was that felt really refreshing to read, for sure. He can write for great sure. dialogue. Rothfuss has, I think one of his attributes is he has patience. He's very willing to just let scenes sit and take their natural course. I think what you were saying about Sanderson's skills, because he's so, so concerned about not wasting the reader's time, Mm -hmm. I think part of that is he can at times hit the bare minimum of what he needs to hit to get the plot moving where it needs to go. And with things like (laughs) we mentioned uh, certain points in our previous 
Buddy Reed, where we're like, we're really glad that Sanderson didn't spend too much time <laughs> on right. uh, the Belger relationship. <laughs> but <laughs> we also see a totally different approach in what Rothfuss is doing. And I think that was a, a nice juxtaposition for us. Yes, it was. Very pleasurable experience. I don't know. Patrick just has a way of getting in his characters' heads that it's incredible. It really comes out in the voice and the dialogue. And to frame it all in a story that's told as a, <laughs> someone telling a story is like really, really interesting. Yeah, well, remember he he spends time crafting things as uh, to try to get them perfect basically and i think he said he he started this book in 1994 if i'm getting that right it was the the mid 90s wow. and yeah he he's been chipping away at this for a while and i a quote i grabbed was that quote says at some point <laughs> When he's telling Gronkler, look, you're not going to get a word off from what I say. He he tells Gronkler, nearly perfect doesn't quite suit me. And I thought maybe that was Rothfuss. <laughs> a little bit of his own voice coming out. Speaking through a little out. bit there. Yeah. <laughs> very, most, very likely. But Quoth isn't afraid to be uh, self-deprecating in his story either, which, uh, I all, which is a good Definitely dimension not. to his character. Because sometimes you can forget when a scene is playing that it's being told as a story and Patrick can kind of weave in Quoth's kind of retrospective. Um, one of these, like, there's so many moments where he, like, sneaks in these little self-deprecating quips. But one of the ones that I really like is when he just, um, he just fought that dragon creature and he was getting... The Dracus. The Dracus, and he was getting uh, healed, and it, the, there's a, a moment where he's like, "The local sawborn doctor had sawbone doctor had patched me up as best he could, and unfamiliar with the thickness of my skull, expressed serious <laughs> doubts as to whether or not I would ever wake." So <laughs> he has these moments throughout the whole thing where he's just like, "Yeah, I was an idiot, or uh, I, I had a thick skull." It's, really clever ways to inject character into these otherwise more exposition-esque <laughs> parts of the story. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's that other quote where he is in that sympathy matchup yeah. and he picks straw, which is a really bad choice. Uh, and he I have says, the quote if you want me to read it. Oh. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, I have it. that moment. Well, it's a, so he's describing how a sympathy match, kind of the mechanics of a sympathy match. And he goes, this involves splitting your mind into two different pieces. One piece tied to hold the alar that your piece of wicking or straw, if you were stupid, was one of the same as the wick <laughs> of the candle you were trying to light. So he was like, this was a really dumb thing that I was doing. But, <laughs> oh, no, I love yeah, that I love moment, that. too. I genuinely chuckled when i when i read that <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's just so many great moments oh when he introduced uh, a benthi he said uh, if not for him i would never have become the man i am today i ask that you not hold it against him he meant well <laughs> that's an awesome one too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like <laughs> so he's not afraid to uh, be self-deprecating in the same breath as he gives admiration for his first mentor he also uh balances it out by taking a jab at himself for sure it's uh it's a lot of really good good stuff there charles i i really want to get into talking about one of the most controversial topics and... let's get into it yeah okay it's uh, something that viewer viewers something that readers are very divided over in this fandom is Denna quotes love interest in this book, and I have been 
patrolling the <laughs> the R fantasy subreddits and things like that, and just watching these debates play out. Uh, I don't know how much of that you've caught wind of, Charles. I started to, uh, but everyone also always loops in wise man's fear in with the discussion so having not read it trying to avoid spoilers i figured you would kind of pioneer the discussion and research on this one and i would react based on my book one knowledge gotcha well i i have a lot of intense (laughs) thoughts i think about like i have very strong (laughs) opinions about denna and her relation with quote I, so you're not going to hear me being like, I don't get what all the fuss is about. And I, well, why don't you start <laughs> with, into them. why don't you start with what the controversy is? Sure. I will gladly. And I actually grabbed a quote from uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Okay. And he says, some days I feel like Denna is the best character I've ever written because different people feel different ways about her and they can justify their beliefs with passages from the text. Some days I feel like Denna is my greatest failure as an author because I haven't brought her to you as clearly as I sometimes wish to. Some days I just really want a donut. That's Patrick Rothfuss. <laughs> and I'll get into, I, I guess since I have a pretty one-sided opinion on this i i should at least start with trying to get across what how both sides feel i don't know how how good a job i'll do on that because <laughs> i'm sure you'll my do great bias. thank you charles well i think that a lot of readers see denna as just a not particularly good fit for Quoth, I think they see her as something or someone, uh, well, maybe something that might be part of the problem, but they see her as someone who interrupts the flow of the story. And I, I think that one come, comes up a decent amount. Uh, they see her as flighty and uh, capricious, I would say. Okay. And they just dislike her and there's many people who would rather that quotes main love interest be one of the many other uh, women in this book i think a lot of people will ship quoth and ari they'll ship quoth and uh, fella and quoth and devi i mean so i think it's a combination of i'm just trying to say their points and not what what i think uh because i i yeah i think that's their those are their main points please email or tweet at us or whatever if you have (laughs) other reasons why you dislike denna but but those are the main ones i see coming up and then the the side that likes denna is the one i'll go on a diatribe about (laughs) i guess so I, should I get into that or do yeah. you want to get out your opinion? No, there, no. I think I, I think you're the leader on this discussion, and I would say you're on a roll. So keep it going. All right. Well, I <laughs> I didn't mean to do this. Uh, I wasn't like, oh, I'll prepare something for this, but then I ended up uh i ended up writing something in my notes anyway that was supposed to be like bullet points of what to hit on and then i just started ranting to my notes on uh, my iphone i I think i'll yeah i I think i'll start with just saying like i i get choked up like i'm a little embarrassed to say this but i it's the truth sharing it with you in the podcasting world like literally when Denna started to come up again I started to get choked up like not I wasn't crying but I was like feeling that kind of feeling you'd get where if something you just need one more push to start crying and that happened to me multiple times when I started reading about Denna so I have like these like strong like feelings uh, that come up with Denna and I, I think some of it is 
I've seen this on a lot of like Reddit type forums when people talk about is like if you've had experiences with people that are kind of like Denna, which I I think Charles, you're you're my longtime friend. Uh, (laughs) I won't get into the (laughs) details of any of that, but I I think you'd attest that I've known a few people with some similar uh, (laughs) tendencies to Denna. Um, For sure. So I think like Denna reminds me of a lot of those experiences that I've had. So so I'm really like emotional about it. But um, I'll say that I I also think that just like rationally from a story point of view, I think she's a well done character. I can get into that now. <laughs> uh, I think that. When people dislike Denna, uh, I think a lot of it comes from that they're they're used to the love interest, uh, even if they're coy or whatever. Uh, especially women, if if I'm being honest here, uh, they just come around to like being with the main character and falling at the main character's feet and all of these kind of things. And I I think that some readers whether they realize or not kind of think that like Denna owes quoth that by nature of being the love interest in his story. And I think that like she isn't really doing much of that. And I think we also know that at another level oh, from early on in the book in the frame story, it, quoth is this innkeeper now in a small town and Denna is nowhere in sight. And based on something that Chronicler says early on, we know she's played some huge role in why things have gone so awry for Quoth. So I think people are watching this like Denna, like she is uh, flighty or, or whatnot, right? Like she's not uh, easy to find for Quoth and she kind of just like pops up at uh, these more random seeming points. Uh, and we kind of, I think people can see Denna's flightiness uh, through this lens of like all of this is going to be for nothing because they don't at least at the time the frame story as far as we know they, they don't seem to like end up happily ever after so I think people get frustrated by that I think that uh, they're like if we're going to go through all of this with Denna then we deserve or we should get some sort of like thing at the end where they're happy together and they know they're not going to get that so i think it's a frustrating process for them to walk through that with quoth and i think that like this this point's been brought before but i i really resonate with it it i think that what, what people don't see when they see all these characteristics about denna is that she's basically just like quoth so if we like Quoth, right, and part of why people don't like Denna is that they like Quoth and they want him to end up with someone else, right? And they want what's best for him, all this kind of stuff. We, we like Quoth. All of these characteristics that uh, Denna has that people get pissed about are the same ones that Quoth is constantly displaying. And I think that if you actually read this book, and I did uh, with an eye to this, Almost every time they meet up, Denna finds Quoth and not vice versa. And we can say maybe she has better luck finding Quoth or whatnot, but like Quoth is like just as difficult to track down most of the time. Uh, he is, I think people also get bothered by Denna not like, uh, not just saying how she feels about Quoth. Quoth doesn't say how he feels about Denna. Uh, like they are teenagers, so give them both a break. <laughs> and then uh, this kind of like uh, dialogue exchange. If if they don't like Denna's side of it, like they probably shouldn't like quotes either because he's always engaging in the same thing. I think we're just in quotes point of view. So then we get uh, more of this perspective like, oh, but quote is looking for Denna all the time. Oh, it's so clear that quote uh, like is trying to, uh, be with Denna, but it's like honestly, I think if we <laughs> it had a neutral point of view, it's more clear that like Denna is trying to like be with 
quoth it's quoth being as he's very willing to say with all the self-deprecation we've talked about like he's being an idiot as many 16 year old uh, people are so i think that's uh that's my long tirade <laughs> about data also good dialogue i think <laughs> like i do enjoy it that's like such a my, i really enjoy their dialogue a lot of these seven words things i enjoy the idea of her like wanting to search for meaning like the seven words that quoth told her initially um that she said were the like seven words to i think make a woman fall in love with you or or i i was just wondering why you're here I, that's she actually misquotes him when she <laughs> tells it the second time, which it's hard to know if that was purposeful or not. So I kind of like this idea. She's like, uh, she reveals she almost died as a baby and is kind of just like wondering why she survived, thinking there's got to be some sort of meaning in that. And there's more in Wise Man's Fear, but I won't get into it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we fall on the same side of this, uh, I, for lack of a better word, controversy. For me, if I had never searched this book on the internet, I would have never even thought a controversy was possible in this discussion. Mm. Just because I was so, I found the relationship, um, many components of the relationship to come from a very honest place, a very relatable place. And uh, like you said, knowing, having known you personally for so long, I was (laughs) reading some of these moments and I was like, Oh, no wonder Marsh is obsessed <laughs> with these books because I just see so much. Uh, I knew you'd feel that. Too. I see so much of you in quote, especially uh, with with Denna. And I mean, I've been there too. It's if anyone's ever like tried to court someone that, uh, especially early on in their life, and that person's getting a lot of male attention and you're not sure where your relationship stands and you're afraid to make moves and you think you're being respectful by not making moves even though there's an opportunity to it's it's an act of being like nervous but also being justified by like oh i don't want to be another one of those guys it's like all very all very relatable and in the world of fantasy is very kind of unique uh, to read a relationship like this, especially when you know, like you said, she's not with Quoth at the time of when they're in the in the inn telling the story. So you know something has happened, but from the perspective of them as teenagers, it's a yes. really honest portrayal. And then another thing that we have to consider is that this is Quoth telling the story from his perspective about their relationship as well which makes a huge difference uh it may seem like uh denna just kind of shows up when she shows up and you know she's making all these moves and quote is being kind of nervous but that's just that's his perspective and that's a very honest perspective for like a teenage boy to have especially when they have no experience with women and then then they get entangled with someone like Denna who um, is, and we should also make the point that Denna is kind of seeing like dating people or whatever as a way of survival. She doesn't have money and Quoth doesn't have money either. And and she's looking to get patrons. She's, she's trying to get her own security established. And and that's part of what Quoth sees as her, maybe she's, dating that person oh she's in the arms of that man but quoth doesn't know her relationship with a lot of these people and she's trying to survive as well and they're both teenagers trying to figure out what to do another neither one of them seems very uh skilled in the art of dating they're having a hard time being honest with each other i think patrick writes these great moments where denna kind of gives quoth an in to make a move and then Quoth, he does a great job of writing Quoth as someone who recognizes it, but is like kind of afraid to act yes. on it. So I, from all of those places, puts me on the side of this relationship is really interesting. And it doesn't have to be like, a oh, they happen to be two people of the opposite uh, sex in proximity to each other. Let's see if they end up together or not. It's uh, 
it's just an honest portrayal of um, a teenage uh, relationship. So I, I am so far still in it, and the, the idea of her popping up everywhere, it's... I don't think it derails from the story at all. It's obviously a huge character development for Quoth that he's trying to figure out because he's such a savant in everything. So it's it's nice to see him get kind of derailed by these moments with Denna and it kind of adds a little more roundness to his to his character where he's kind of seemingly perfect in so many ways to see him kind of fumble with women and, and not just Denna but with other women as well is very interesting and and it's funny to hear quote tell the story there was one point where he was like and then i walked away from that encounter and i was like she was inviting me into her room and she wasn't wearing any clothes that was really dumb of me <laughs> like, what was i thinking <laughs> so it's like those kind of retrospective moments were uh were were great and i think it all comes through this kind of teenage relationship and you get so many good quotes and and descriptions of these moments with denna one of my favorite ones is when he's describing denna and he goes uh we stare at a fire because it flickers because it glows the light is what catches our eyes but what makes a man lean close to a fire has nothing to do with its bright shape what draws you to a fire is the warmth you feel when you come near the same was true with denna so i mean beautiful and moments like that that's so nice. Make make the book make the book worth reading. So I, we're on the same side of this of this debate here. Charles, I'm I'm glad to hear that because <laughs> I think I've been stewing in my feeling, as you probably noticed when I just <laughs> ran off like a freight train when you <laughs> let me talk about Denna. Like I've been stewing in my feelings about uh, like Denna and quotes relationship with. Denna and reading these online discussions and I have been for a long time wondering what you would think of Denna because I think you know I, I, I think this is a compliment I've always admired Charles your like <laughs> stability in relationships I, I think <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know how comfortable you are with that being mentioned on the podcast but it's <laughs> not very raunchy like <laughs> Charles is pretty interpersonally stable including in romantic relationships from what I've seen uh, uh and sure. <laughs> I th I thought maybe someone who's like been so <laughs> level-headed and, and all of that and I thought maybe I would get the other side from you where like it is that I'm just <laughs> drawing from all of my experiences that have been uh, kind of reminiscent of this dinner relationship and right uh, and it, and maybe the, even if that was the case like maybe that would say something about uh, like hey if you've had certain experiences you would feel that way if you haven't you had For it sure. and that's just subjective art yeah i think a lot of people would there's a i bet there's a lot of people out there who can relate to the Denna Quoth relationship, and I would think so too. Like, even like you know, uh, as, as stable as my interpersonal relationships have been historically. I mean, there's <laughs> humble brag. There's <laughs> yeah, there's certainly Denna moments, you know, especially when you're younger. Like, I wouldn't. I don't. I remember, you know, being like a freshman in college and meeting people and trying to to date people and 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 not being totally aware of when it being nervous to make moves and like recognizing like oh they might be like telling me to like dropping hints to make moves but I'm afraid to blah 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 and then uh so yeah I mean we've all been there and I think anyone that can relate to that relationship would find uh, a lot of meaning in it in the story and I think Patrick Rothfuss did a great job of, in his descriptions uh, and through the prose and voice of Quoth, bring that relationship to life so much so that it strikes a chord with people that have had that shared experience. Well stated, Charles. And I, I saw a video where Rothfuss was asked a question that was essentially... <laughs> who messed you up so bad? <laughs> who hurt you? you? Created a character <laughs> like Denna, 
and he very intentionally sidestepped it by <laughs> saying he was going to sidestep it and then talked for a while about uh, Ari. <laughs> <laughs> and then during that, though, he was like, you know, sometimes we assume we know things about authors because of uh, their writing and we can draw these conclusions that seem logical. And in this case, you are 100% right. But sometimes people are wrong, <laughs> which was amazing. I mean, I, that's such a, I mean, that voice is so strong uh, in quote, quote talks like that so much also. <laughs> He's not afraid to yeah. like recognize tropes of things and being like, well, it wasn't like that or it's totally like that. Or that self-deprecation <laughs> is beautiful and it doesn't surprise me one bit. I would, I would guess that he's shared these same experiences that we can both relate to as well. It's like you, mm. he must have in order to have described it this way. It's a, uh, a unique story, and com- compared to the relationships of other fantasy series, like not to bring back Mistborn again, but I, I would say there's more truth and honesty and in the complication of Denon and Quoth's relationship than all of the relationships in Mistborn. But this is, this book is about character and relationships. So that's just kind of what you have to be open to in this book. And if that's not something you enjoy, then there can't be much in this series for you anyway. So for sure. Well, I'll bring you back to the first part of that Rothfuss quote where he says, some days I feel like Denna is the best character I've ever written because different people feel different ways about her and they can justify their beliefs with passages from the text. And I think there's something to be said for Denna and her relationship with Quoth that people feel this strongly about it. And yeah, there's a reason, you know, we love Mistborn and there's a reason at the same time why Vin and Ellen is not going to bring up that many strong feelings or arguments or anything like right. that because it's such a straightforward playing of the love interest. Right. I mean, I like we get to see their relationship evolve and all this kind of stuff. They have some turmoil or whatever, but they're both just these people who at the end of the day you know they're always going to choose each other you know they're always going to end up trust in each other (laughs) and trust in each other even if there's times where it feels like they might not and with quoth and denna it just feels so real and honest to how relationships go and yeah uh, not all the time but sometimes and i think patrick i think that's such a great quote that you pulled from patrick because it's completely true when i was researching this um book even for a review of reviews so combing through reviews trying to curate some for the next show yeah it's amazing how con- it's like a best-selling book one of the best-selling modern fantasy books it's maybe the or way up there and the reviews Other are than incredibly Game of thrones maybe yeah and it's or song of ice and fire books and it's incredibly controversial <laughs> for every five star review there's a one star review and everyone's so pan all these reviews are like essays and it's incredible i think you know at some point it's like yeah maybe you're getting a lot of negative reviews but you've touched all these people in such a way that they're typing up this whole thing and it's become for me surprisingly uh controversial and i just and i think that all stems from pe- Patrick's writing striking chords in people and resonating with people and some people get it and some people don't relate to it at all and it it brings out a really interesting discussion and I think that's a success as a writer to to be able to get reactions from people whether they're strong or negative <laughs> and Patrick, yeah as Patrick said sometimes it's good sometimes it's not sometimes you you just want a donut so I <laughs> I think you should consider it a success just by all the conversation around it. It's incredible. I wholeheartedly agree, Charles. And there's another (laughs) controversial topic that I want to 
get us into Let's that do I it. have another tirade about <laughs> that I think will be shorter. And uh, the, uh, but I do want to leave the listeners with check out with the Denna and Quoth conversations. A lot of their dialogue is they'll say seven word sentences. So that's a little sort of Easter egg. And <laughs> the the two quotes that I, I want to make sure I got right, because I just said off the top of my head before of the seven words that Quoth says to Denna, at first it's, I was wondering what you're doing here when they first meet. And then when Denna requotes it to Quoth, it's, I was just wondering why you're here. And it's hard to know, was Rothfuss doing something intentional there or not? But <laughs> it's uh, that's a line that... Oh, it's stuck with me. He'd probably yeah. say something clever, like, oh, it's one of those things where it probably is, but I wouldn't put it past me if it wasn't, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, you're capturing Rothfuss's voice there. It's well, easy Charles. to do after reading one of his books. Because <laughs> it's a so strong. Yes, exactly. Yes. All right. The other big controversy, Charles, Bring us in is... <laughs> Is Quoth a Mary Sue or a Gary Stew, which is sometimes <laughs> used to describe men who are showing the features of a Mary Sue? And maybe I, I'd like to hear your first reactions to this, Charles. You want me to lead us into this one? Do you want? I'll get sure, into it no, too if I you can, prefer. If, if you want me to start this one off, I'm happy to share my opinions on it. Because, like, doing the research for review of reviews and all of that, one of the main topping points is, like, oh, Quoth can do everything. He has to perform a song. It's, like, the most difficult song ever that no one can play, and he didn't practice it, but he goes up and nails it. Or, oh, my gosh, this, like, no one can do this. It takes years and years of practice. Oh, I did it in a month. So that happens a lot in this story. So is he a, a Mary Sue? Uh, like, for me, I can see a lot. I can kind of um, see that side of the of the argument very strong. Like, yeah, he's really good at a lot of stuff, everything he tries. So maybe he is, but a part of me thinks, you know, this is a guy telling his own story. So yes. you have to consider his voice. What's he might be, and he also grew up in a theater troupe raised by performers. For sure. So for me, it's, he probably, and he obviously did some amazing things because they allude to it in the present day in the framing story, which is outside of Quoth's voice. It's modern day, it's playing out, and these characters hold him with reverence. So he obviously uh -huh. did do something amazing, and we're used to heroes doing amazing things but what we're not used to is um them coming up and being absolutely amazing at everything they try but i think a lot of that comes from quotes describing himself and trying to move through parts of the story so he was like yeah i mastered this and i did that and i excelled at this you may have heard of me you know he's like i did all these things so part of me is like especially when he's playing for his pipes you can kind of roll your eye that for me was kind of like a well, whatever they made such a big deal about how hard the song was and then he just crushed it and i think that was the most damning piece of evidence for him of being a mary sue but it didn't bother me so much because this is a story about a unique guy and we're hearing it from his voice so he's going to play it up a bit and we know that he's not in the end he something happens where his whole life gets exactly. turned upside down. Like he became a man. So I don't want to say broken, but he's um, running in. He's in. waiting to die. Charles. He's I think he's I mean, broken might be hard, but it, uh, it's a little final, but he's pretty, he's in bad shape. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with setting ambitions aside to run an in, <laughs> but waiting to die. No, he, is, there's literally, yeah. that's the third silence, right? Is in that, the, of a man waiting to die. Yeah. So he's obviously not all powerful and all understanding. And he definitely has his faults. Like even in his own point of view, he's, 
struggling with his relationships with women and he's rubbing people the wrong way all of his professors don't like him so a lot of times when he's talking to other people he um rubs them the wrong way and he definitely people one of the things the professor's like oh you have to learn patience or oh, you're too arrogant or you shouldn't rush this and all the you know he's he's missing all these cues these social cues with women and things like that so it does help to round out his character and the framing device of him being like a shell of his former self also kind of rounds this out so i think what we're seeing is from a storyteller's perspective about himself he's building himself up as this perfect being because he's telling the story of how he came to be his current self which is like his downfall so you have to build up this guy to be as high as you can so that when he does whatever this moment that we don't know yet happens happens to him so it's true, going to be Charles. this dramatic horrible thing that someone who you think has at this point been built up to be infallible we know doesn't make it so i think that's the whole point of this story at this point and we've read a whole book and that's still the case we didn't get that payoff like we would get maybe in a more traditional story structure but it's coming and i think critics of the story need like just don't enjoy that aspect of it. It's like, it's a story that's taking its time to be told from the voice of the main character who may not be the most reliable narrator who has a flair for theatrics. So uh -huh. I, I love it and I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going. So is he a Mary Sue? Probably, but that's kind of the point basically is where I'm going with it and I enjoy it. Yeah, hit on some great points there, Charles. And Thank you. Yeah, credit to you for coming in with all that after one read. <laughs> uh, I think I, I basically just want to echo and maybe slightly build on some of your points that you made there. I think you nailed it with this idea that we already know all of this comes crashing down. If he were a Mary Sue, <laughs> everything would work out in the end. That's part of the point with Mary Sue's. And we know this is going to tumble down around him. And I think the more we build him up, the more dramatic that is. It's, it's right. written like a tragedy, this mm -hmm. thing. So I think that's a huge point. I won't get any deeper into that because I think you covered that so well. Then you hit on this idea that he's potentially an unreliable narrator. I, I tried to weave in as many examples when we were talking about the quotes there, because right. I knew I was going to bring this controversy up about what Scarpy says about stories through quotes mouth. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, then all these other times where we get hints that the story that Quoth is telling is exaggerated in a lot of ways that Denna has a crooked nose that <laughs> <laughs> he says the best lies about him are the ones that he told when he gets the quote, the bloodless nickname, he talks about how he leans into that. And there's plenty of times where he very explicitly takes action to try to enhance his legend and i think that there's uh, and i i'll also say that he is only willing to let chronicler have his story if quoth gets complete and utter control over the narrative yes. so what makes us think that something has changed about this aspect of quoth where he no longer has a desire to make himself more legendary when he's telling his story in the way that the world is going to hear it. So I think the entire... Basically, if the story was not within this broader frame story, then I think Quoth is a Mary Sue. I think that if that's bothersome enough to you that you can't enjoy the book, 
then okay. It's not for you. That's right. fine. Very well said. But the story is within this larger frame story that is painted as a tragedy. There are all these hints that Quoth is an unreliable narrator throughout. And I, I think they're they're not really concealed or subtle. They're They're right there. And I think when the story is viewed in its entirety, it's not accurate to call Quoth a Mary Sue. Very, very well said. I th- I think we're on the exact same page. The Im- the important detail is this is told from Quoth's point of view. And you made a great point when you said, you know, if this was being told like the framing device was, as more on this end, you're seeing what's happening like as facts. Yeah, it would like if you're just being told the story of a kid who came up and did all these amazing things, it would be way more obvious. But I think there's a lot to pick up on in terms of Quoth's background as a storyteller and the hints he's dropping throughout that uh, you know, about lying and, and truths and, and mm-hmm. myths and legends and his own myth. And you, you hit on so many great points there. I think we crushed it. I hope, uh, I you know, maybe we... I think we defended ourselves well. And if, <laughs> I think we may have hopefully opened up some some minds to the idea that th- there's a bigger plan in all this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too, Charles. I, I'm so happy to <laughs> be able to talk through all of this with you, Charles. I'm just <laughs> glowing over here. I'm also happy. I, I guess maybe the podcast could potentially <laughs> benefit from us not being on the same page so much. Like, right. I guess there could be something good in this idea because I didn't know what you were going to think of any of these things. I thought maybe we'd be going back and forth a little bit with different takes, but I, <laughs> I think that this is part of why we've, uh, yeah, been such I think good we've covered for so long, right? <laughs> like exactly. we are, <laughs> but you know, we are I think we did a good a job. Here. Exactly, but I do think you know you especially do a good job of placating everybody. So I think we did cover all the opinions, and we said, you know what? If you, there's certain things that if they're not for you, it's totally understandable. So I don't think we're for coming sure. from a place that's um, saying that they're wrong. I think there's a great case to be made. For for all, that's what makes it so controversial is there's so much to draw from this text, whether you agree with it or not, that makes for a great conversation. And I think it helps that we can both kind of enjoy the same point of view and represent it so well so that maybe a listener can consider ideas that maybe they hadn't thought of when reading the book for the first time. So, no, I think it was great. It does make for a great conversation, Charles, and one that you are now a part of, which is yes, which was my number (laughs) one thing I was pitching for you. Man, in two weeks I'll be able to participate in the whole conversation. I won't have to look out for spoilers anymore. That's true. I can go on all the forums and everything. (laughs) (laughs) I'm excited for all of it, and I. I know that there's many people with uh, opinions about this who maybe sure. would be interested in contacting us or talking to us about <laughs> yes, some of the things we, that we've We're said more here. than happy to continue this discussion with the listeners. And where can they reach us, Charles? Where can't they reach us? Uh, uh, basically, all of social media, we are the FTF Podcast, except for Twitter, where we are the FTF Podcast 1. You can also That's email the us. That's the digit one, yes. You can also email us at the FTF podcast at gmail.com. And yep. uh, that's it. You can also find our podcast in the main places podcasts can be found. Uh, there were so many other <laughs> Apple, quotes and Spotify. things that I would have been happy to share, but I think we have covered the big points today. We've hit our milestone for time. I'm excited for review of reviews, and I encourage listeners to check it out because these reviews are all over the place. <laughs> They're all over the place. <laughs> people hating this book and people lo- gushing over this book. So I have a feeling that this review of reviews is going to be particularly um, 
volatile. So I'm looking forward to getting into that discussion. I am looking forward to it as well, Charles. It is always a pleasure buddy reading with you. And I couldn't say it any better myself. It is always a pleasure to be buddy reading with you as well. Be sure to check us out in, in, in two weeks when we read The Wise Man's Fear, book two of the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. You do not want to miss it. I'm going to go ahead and play us out with the outro. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Get cracking on that next book because we're going to have a lightning fast conversation about that one in two weeks. Be sure to check out Review of Reviews for Name of the Wind coming out soon. You're not going to want to miss it, folks. And we wouldn't want you to miss it. No, we would hate for you to miss it. And as always, go forth and conquer, friends.